Well, and, and uh, that's how intimate it was. Hey, I don't belong here. I shouldn't be listening to these people, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I found out uh, just quite by accident uh, when uh, I got my new sound tape of uh, Cinerama Holiday yeah. that when I ran it to uh, the, the press here, just a private showing for them, and uh, uh, I had not run after I got the new sound tape, you know, because I had been running it with my old sound tape at my home. I got the new sound tape and I had not run it uh, as far as uh, the section in there where you're at the uh, nightclub, with the Club Lido. Yeah. And I was running it and all of a sudden the guy was sick. I thought, what's going on here? And then the more it ran, you know, the more I realized that, hey, I haven't heard this music. You know? And there's, I've got about, I'd say, uh, it's right around between four and 500 feet of sound tape that I had to delete from the master recording that they made my recording from, my new recording. Mm. And then when I checked the numbers though, on the side of the film, yeah. it was not a big number jump. It has had not been cut from the film other than before they numbered the film. So oh. I mean, so they evidently elected, they had a problem there. Well, no, they thought it was too long, uh -huh. a sequence, evidently, and they cut that much out of, of Club Lita, you know. And, and that, and, but did and correct you correct copy was before they cut it? Yeah, no, right, that's right. In other words, um, this was what, what before they actually made the film do a sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, but but I, I heard some kind of a phase shift in yeah. the sound during yeah. the second I've got day. another new recording coming. That happened to Jack Dimmers. He couldn't believe, uh, I mean, he was really you know, very persnickety about recording because he made these heads as well, you know. Yeah. But uh, I, I told him I wanted the recording made simply off of the record, my original recording. But he used it off of a recording that came out of the vault of Pacific Theaters. Uh -huh. And it was a problem with phase yeah. shift, and he heard it. But he uh, was feeling ill and died before I could get him to do it, re redo this. Yeah. But I am getting a new uh, Act Two sound tape that does away with this, like when they applaud, yeah. you hear the face. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Because I, cause I, I tried uh, I tried doing like a phase shift to do a pseudo stereo, uh -huh. I did it on tape, and it sounded like a, it sounded like you were sitting in a wind. Yeah, so, really, right. And, and, and I, yeah. I got a little bit so of I, that. I had I even... Like one, tr one track was a little bit... I had even asked, asked uh, Jack to send me back my original tape, really? uh, which had been out there for about a year, and he was thinking, well, you, I don't think you'll be able to use it, John, but anyhow, uh, I never got it back, and uh, I was going on what he was telling me, that it had, in a year of sitting there, it got so badly warped, that's, uh, that's why he determined it would be no good to me, you know. But uh, my my original sound tape didn't have that, that problem. Yeah. It's just whatever. I didn't find that especially annoying, I just noticed it. Well, whatever they recorded, uh, Chase Productions recorded off of recently, they, yeah. they don't have that problem they're telling me. Okay, well, so that's why I get a, a better one. But where? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yesterday. Maybe my living room. My other living room. <laughs> I'll see you next week. Okay, all right. Yesterday you said uh, you never got to meet Fred Waller? Yes, that's right. If you had, what would you have told him? If I would have had a chance to meet him, well, first of all, I was uh, so naive uh, at 17, I was afraid to even go up to the projectionist of any one of the three booths because I was old enough to understand, what if I mess up by talking to them, you know? They will hate me forever, you know? And uh, and really, I, uh, I've had that experience here. Uh, any time I've ever had a film break here, it was because I, I had talked to somebody while I was doing my work, and a real fell because I didn't put a, a real lock on you know, This one here is not hard to forget. But, but the others that I have to screw in, or you know, so I took steps after that happened, of course. Uh, and that's why Larry puts a bodyguard on me, you know, so that I don't break everything I have to be thinking about. I, I mean, I got to be thinking about not just loading the film up, but set, setting the sink at the projector before I load it in, you know, and on the sound reproducer. And that's, uh, I mean, just that one thing that you can screw up. And what if it comes time for me to start the show and I hit this button up here to lock in the cells and motors and I hear something jump, you know? Now I wonder, oh no, did they all move? You know, are they still in sync where I thread it up or do I have to go back now and, and do it right? Only because I didn't remember, you know, to set the, the sync mark on the cells before I thread it up. So, and that, that part has to be adhered to. I have to be my own policeman. 
uh, and uh, but I've got a good good track record. Good. Uh, and uh, I can, unless I don't get through next weekend, I can honestly say ever since we've been here in the Neon, I've never lost a performance, not one. I've run them all. And uh, uh, even if I had a diode go out to, because a light bulb wouldn't come on, I had those diodes on hand, knew how to replace them, and the audience would patiently wait there, and when I was able to get on maybe 15 minutes later, they applauded and we were on with the show. You know, I, I, you know, I hate for that to happen, but how can you know when that's going to happen? You can't. During the show, do you literally have to hit all three projectors, all uh, three booths? During it? Yeah. Uh, you know, after running the film, what scenes that you need to be in at, uh, attendance to. Sure. Right. And uh, Larry Smith, when he's here, is very helpful, because he knows now with me. Uh, he usually is over, you know, in what they call Charlie Booth, which goes to the right side of the screen, and I float between this area. How do you communicate? Uh, just simply, if, if I if he's over there and it's, nothing's happening when it should be, I go over and hey, Larry, open the door. How's you sleeping here? What? <laughs> <laughs> you know where all the glitches are going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. So uh, no, he has, he's been very helpful that way, but yet I've never. Uh, you know, it's, to this day, I still haven't uh, entrusted him to run the film, say, by himself. And uh, I really think he could, but it's just the idea, I don't want anything to happen to this film. If I can be here, I'm going to be here, you know? I don't want him to say, oh, gee, John, I'm sorry, Have I didn't close. Did you ever close. cancel the showing? Did you uh, will? No, no, no. Matter of fact, when I had it in my home, uh, I would, uh, you know, get... Oh, normally about 15 people lined up to come, and uh, almost always it was 100% attendance. And even in the winter time, when I thought nobody was going to come, people from Kentucky were there, They're ringing my doorbell. You know, is the show start yet? <laughs> and they drove through ice and snow, you know, and made that kind of a trip. Hey. Well, this is not a stupid question. Since he's in the film quite often, uh -huh. have you met with and talked with and worked with the whole Thomas? I, I definitely met Lowell and knew him the last two years of his life. Yes. Yep. And his and his when, widow as well. And when did he die? Oh, gee. Seventy something. Yeah. 73. When I first met him, uh, he was about to be seventy-six, and I called his uh, estate at the time to wish him a happy birthday, and that's uh, the story I told some uh, people that when they, there was an answer, this is the first time I'm calling him from the, from the phone number he gave me, you know. And I said, is Lowell, is uh, Lowell there? And, uh, uh, no, I said, Lowell? The person answered the phone. And, and the person said, no. Uh, I thought he said, this is his brother. I said, brother? And, uh, him. But it turned out to be, this is his butler. And Lowell was not there because at 76, he was celebrating by s snow skiing, you know, out in, uh, 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 Sun Valley or wherever, you know, where you always like to go. If I can find my book, I can see it now. Would you mind signing it for me for him? Sure. sure. Yes, sure will. I I've, got, space. I've got his autograph and, uh, and what was his favorite uh, of the films that he made as far as Seven Wonders of the World. Because hmm. when I met him, it was at Memorial Hall, and I had the booklet of the films that he had made, you know, different booklets. And he finally, he spent most time with Seven Wonders of the World. It and also features one. him the most, doesn't it? Well, in a, it, no, it serves for paradise. It, oh, okay. Well, I mean, he, he becomes somewhat of a ham in Seven Wonders, but uh, in uh, Search for Paradise, even uh, Mrs. Thomas, uh, his widow, uh, when she saw it at my home, said, well, you know, he, he really was hamming it up in this picture, wasn't he? You know, because he's on camera so much, you know. Yeah. And, and when you think about this first film uh, that you saw yesterday, this is Cinerama, uh, that uh, all through that film is narration. You, know? you don't actually have the more intimate contact as the second film would give the audience, where people are actually talking. You know, but his uh, narration and, is so effective, I think. Yes, right. I mean, they, and they, but yet they wove in that little comedy bit of uh, humor, I mean, in uh, Cypress Gardens about Tony. You know, hurry up, hurry up, Tony. You know, you're always late. Get going. How long have you owned the This is so hard.
second city in the world. It's supposed to be Chicago after the old thing in New York. The second, you know, where do we install next? Chicago. No union problems. Too many people for projections. We got to work this out. Too much time involved to do this. Where we want to do it real quick. Detroit Music Hall was the second city in the world to have center. And I have yep, the sound reproducer that anybody in the Detroit area that went there to see Southern Hamlet are here. I've got the uh, original uh, sound reproducer that's been there on the, my museum at home. How much, <laughs> how much extra equipment do you have? How many more sound reproducers? How many more projectors do you have in your oh, okay. uh, collection? Well, I've got, uh, I've got another reproducer like this, uh, plus the one I was just talking about that, that's of a different design, but definitely the, the original uh, type of ceramic used. Yeah. And then I have a Stancil Hoffman, uh, which not was not Cinerama, but now that I know what it takes to make uh, you know, work and all that, yeah. uh, could be readily modified. used and modified to, to run Cinerama sound tape. Yeah. Uh, there's also a, a friend of mine that lives in Cleveland, privately, that has built a big, beautiful home and I'm installing Cinerama in his basement. The basement that when he built the home is 11 foot deep in his basement. What's he going to use for film? Uh, he has a print of Howlin' West was one that was originally to come to me, but it has water damage at the beginning of each act for about six minutes. Still run. Uh, and uh, what happened was uh, the person that was supposed to, you know, let me have this print, give it to me, changed his mind but never told me. In other words, <laughs> this guy in Cleveland, and, it, and there was kind of not what you call a good feeling at that time, because the print was promised to me, and he didn't have anything to run it on. He was, I knew all he was going to do was just lay it against the walls of his house and say, hey, I've got a print of how this was going. And I would have equipment to run it, but he would have the print of Cleveland. So why uh, things were happening, I got an even better print after that. No one And when he saw that, when he came down to see it, his print has new lion's head. It will now, out of my making it possible for him, because the print I've got just not too long ago from Peru, uh, although damaged, there are parts of it usable. So I'm going to put, you know, out of the kindness of my heart, the lion head growling in sync on the front of his print that he, that he doesn't have right now. Do you store <laughs> and without these, water damage. Do you store these prints under any special conditions? No. And I think. Uh, Maybe uh, it's just uh, for the climate that's here in Ohio, and the fact that I store them you know, in my home, which is uh, you know the temperature is that of, for what a human being wants, you know, not overly either way, not too hot, not too cold, and the humidity, you know, uh, is, you, you want to make sure. That's right. So uh, uh, I had film in my downstairs cinema, but I definitely have a dehumidifier down there. Uh, to make sure that uh, there's nothing that's going to be sticking together mm -hmm. in front of the film that year. Have you seen all the Cinerama three panel films? Uh, yes. Uh, the, the only one I didn't get to see, other than off a of videotape that was made when they projected it in England, was Windjam, but that was because I was in the Army at the time in, in Korea. And I couldn't, and when they came into Dayton on a portable basis <laughs> to show it, they showed it at the yeah, local Tadio Theater here. They took out two huge Norelco Tadio projectors just long enough to run that film. And then they put all that equipment back into the booth. Now the Windjammer system yes. looked like it had three... As far as projection, uh, made it possible uh, by using mirrors on the two end machines. Uh, it wasn't uh, to have them close together for a mechanical or anything. It was just to have them in the same, well, one, a single projection room, a long projection room. Less people, I guess. Uh, well, you know, you still needed the same people because of the problem of assisting reels. Unlike the electronic teacups that I've installed, you know, for my own purposes here, which they didn't have back then. Of course, back then, Cinerama, you know, going on the, out into uh, any particular state, had to deal with all kinds of codes, so they had to adhere stupidly, you know, to, I mean, to these firewalls that didn't exist for safety. But they'd have to have doors on these. By the time How the West was one came out, a lot of localities respected the fact that you had a safety film, you don't have to have a, a big door on that magazine. You know, just 
you know, let the real be out in the open. It's not going to cause any hazardous fire. You know? When I saw this is Cinerama in Miami in 1962, uh -huh. I believe that there was a different audio stereo demonstration that uh, there ran was, in the intermission. There was uh, the only film that really had that was this is Cinerama. Yes. Yeah, okay. But this was the Boston Symphony, and they said they took the equipment to Boston and recorded the Boston Symphony, and then they played it. And they said after they played it back for the Boston Symphony, they all got up and applauded because they said it was the first time they'd actually been able to hear themselves yeah. the way they really sound. Well, uh, if it that, was, does that ring any bells? Have you ever no, not in connection with Cinerama or Cinerama if they'd known that was happening, I wouldn't think they would even allow it. Because they, they did it with Lowell Thomas yeah. narration. You know. What does our esteemed Cinerama Safari expedition think of uh, <laughs> this weekend's entertainment? Oh, uh, it's been a holiday. <laughs> it's been amazing. It's always an adventure. That's great. <laughs> I agree with what he said. <laughs>